please welcome uh, my other friend from the Super Bowl, uh, Bree Ansia. Now, Bree is the youngest site coordinator and the only female site coordinator in the United States for rock and roll tours. Bree has worked with Taylor Swift, Shawn Mendes, the Rolling Stones, along with major events like the Super Bowl, where is where I get to am honored to work with Bree. Um, she's also done WrestleMania and numerous other large scale events, focusing on events that take place within a stadium or festival grounds. Normally the first one in and the last one out on a site coordinator's work is creating something out of nothing. Please welcome my friend, Bree Ansia. Hi, Hi Bree. Jay. Thank hey. you for having me. Oh man, it's good it's to see so you. It's so good to see you. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, without masks on. I know, and never yeah. got to see your mouth the whole time I we were know, at Super Bowl. I know. Well, um, thank you for so, joining us. Yeah, of course. I, I I feel honored, and and I hope um I can give the students some some good insight to to what I do and and some options that they have. Site coordination is kind of taking a stadium show and and building it uh, for a concert tour. You know, as you know, NFL stadiums are not set up in that way. Um, I've worked with Taylor Swift the past 12 years, the Rolling Stones, um, Shawn Mendes, Kenny Chesney. Um, I do WrestleMania, Super Bowl, and then a couple of festivals. I am from Seattle. And um, in Seattle, we basically, uh, I do the Se Seahawks and Seattle Mariners, AEG Live, Concerts West. Um, and as Jay said, I am the only female at the moment uh, in site coordination. I really do hope that there are more that show up in the next uh, few years. Um, the only stadiums I haven't worked so far would be Jacksonville, Lambeau, which is Green Bay, the new LA stadium and the new Vegas stadium. So I started my own company in 2012. Um, I did start in the business when I was 16. Uh, and in 2012, I started B Events and basically focused on production and coordination. I used to have a local staffing company in Seattle, um, but now I hire my staff either locally in the cities that I'm in or bring someone on tour. Um, Super Bowl this year was my fourth year, and I went to school at Washington State University and graduated with a broadcast production major. Um, in terms of site coordination, we are the last, the first one on and the last person off. Um, we contact the venue, we liaise between the tour and the venue. Basically, we are responsible for acquiring all of the needs of the facility. And, and the facility basically goes through us to the liaise to the tour. Once the venue is booked, we, brought, we get brought into the process and, and basically establish everything that would be needed in order to have a successful show in that stadium. So that can come between flooring and and um, getting all of the equipment set up and what rooms would be needed. Um, site coordinators are normally hired either by the tour and the artist or by the promoter. The, the roles vary depending on who you are hired by, but in the end, you have the best interest of both the artist and the promoter in mind when you're putting everything together. You try to give the artists exactly what they want while saving money for the promoters. Examples of venues that I put together would be NFL football stadiums, baseball stadiums, cricket fields, soccer pitches, and open festival grounds. So items that fall under my responsibility would be the, getting the building permits, you know, fire marshal planning, and basically working with the overall site layout and, and putting the stage of the tour in there. Um, field cover, chair layouts, labor, you know, in any city, depending on where we are and and what show it is, we can have anywhere from 100 stagehands locally hired to 500 or 600 stagehands locally hired. It all just depends on the show that you're working at the time. Um, rental equipment, it can really vary depending on the stadium, but it's heavy equipment, cranes, labor, tables, down to drape. You know, site coordinator isn't always responsible for those items, but depending on the tour and depending on kind of the responsibility that you may have given yourself, it kind of works that way. Um, we help with the dressing room allocation and, and walk with the tour themselves because obviously we are the first in. So we are very familiar with the stadium and, and being familiar with the stadium and the tour allows us to make those decisions on both. 
Um, basically anything that you have that would require, you know, something very specific to the venue, that's what the site coordinator does. Um, the tour itself, the production itself is usually the same, no matter what, the same amount of trucks, the same video equipment, the same audio equipment. The thing that changes is the venue. So basically the site coordinator is the one that has to roll with the punches and make sure that those changes are taken care of. So Rolling Stones, um, this is one, uh, the 2019 No Filter Tour. So basically with the Rolling Stones, um, they, they did this tour in 2019 and they did it in 2018 as well, mainly in Europe. When they came to the States, we basically wrangle 20 steel trucks and 25 production trucks. So 45 trucks that we have to find a place locally to, to park during. 20 steel trucks is, is quite a lot for the type of stage that you're building. Then three cranes, 500 local crew, uh, 15 forklifts, 10 golf carts, and 3,200 amps of power. So I'll, I'll go down the list on, on the few other shows. So you can see what that compares to. Um, this is definitely a smaller tour when it comes to comparing to Taylor Swift. So Taylor Swift is is and or was and still is the largest touring show in history um, internationally. We had more trucks, more freight moves, more volume than any other show. The closest one would be the U2 360 tour, that big claw. Some may still be a little young that don't, don't know what that was, but that was a feat in itself. Um, this one had quite a bit more production that was more steel-based and, and structural. If we go to the next one, I can give the stats from Taylor, which again is, is definitely, oh, looks like it didn't, oh, small, but it popped up. Um, so Taylor had 24 steel trucks. It's not that many more than what the Stones had, uh, but we did have quite a few more pieces on our trucks. On top of that, we had 55 production trucks. So you are looking at uh, roughly 80 trucks that that are touring around the States and, and Europe and Australia, New Zealand and Japan. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that this is just one set. So in the United States, Taylor had three, three steel sets that she toured around with because we couldn't make the distances on a lot of these shows. So take that 24 and times it by three, and that's how many trucks were running around that, that myself and one other site coordinator were playing with while building this show. 55 production trucks is very high in terms of production, especially since this had had eight trucks of video, nine trucks of audio. Um, on top of that, you have wardrobe, you have catering, you have uh, trusses, you have all of these other things that go into it. Now, Taylor itself was one of the larger ones with local crew as well. Um, local crew, 650, probably across the span of what the site coordination was and production load-ins, that is very high. You know, that's that's roughly 100, 100 touring crew or 100 local crew a day for the whole week that we're building. Um, depending on the venue, we had up to 24 forklifts, 16 golf carts, and 5,000 amps of power. So that shows the difference between the four video walls that were set up for the Stones and then the Taylor Swift reputation tour. Um, we usually had roughly 70 local runners throughout the week and a runner is something that is really an intro to the concert touring world. Um, a runner is a local person that has a car that runs errands for the band, but they can do anything from you know, production assistant work and corralling local people to running around getting supplies for the crew and and learning, you know, what nuts and what bolts we need to get in order to fix the, the things that are happening around backstage. Next, we have, uh, I believe the next one is Taylor Swift in Tokyo. You know, one thing in Tokyo that I, the reason I like to, to show Tokyo is because the way that they do things there is, um, is very, very efficient. They have an army of people. There's no attrition in terms of crew showing up. Um, and this particular show, we had a, a huge schedule conflict. Um, 
And I'm sorry that I can't show you all the pictures with the sharing not working uh, for me. Uh, but basically what, what we saw here in Tokyo is that we had a, a anime show that popped up and, and then we had a BTS show and then we were just after the BTS show. Now the Taylor stage for this tour takes or took about 18 and a half hours to build. And that is just the steel. So that is from the ground up, all of that black steel that you see flying there. That is, that is what it takes to build the steel. On top of that, it takes a solid 10 hours to build all the video. And that doesn't include testing. So we basically take for production, it is basically a day and a half. And for steel, it is three days. So you are looking at roughly four and a half to five days in order to get this show to happen. And with BTS, they were the night before. So we had to come in two weeks early and set the flooring or set the base of our stage. And the anime show came on top of that. As soon as the anime shows was done, we came back and built all of the towers and had BTS build their video wall in front of it. As soon as BTS was done, they took down their video and we put up the rest of our stage. So it, it is very complicated, but if this happened in any other city, it probably wouldn't have been possible. But the way that the Japanese facilitate building a show is very efficient. And the, the other set, cool thing about Japan is that when people are leaving the stadium, there's no garbage on the floor and they all leave when their rows and seats are called. So every section when you see only one section stands up and leaves at a time, it is not mass exodus, very controlled. And again, something that we would never do in the States. So the next one on the list would be Sean Mendes. <clears throat> this one was uh, very fun for me, especially because Sean Mendes started um, as the opener of openers on a Taylor tour. And so I've known Sean since he was about 15 and, and just a very sweet kid. And he's grown into to a superstar. Um, Toronto was his very first production uh, or stadium show. And, and other than being an opener on one of them. And he only had four steel trucks, but I came in to kind of manage and corral, you know, the first, the first time jitters of having a stadium show for the crew and, and make all of this possible. This was in Toronto at Rogers Center. Uh, we had 23 production trucks and 250 local crew. This was a fun one to do. Uh, we hung everything from the roof of the Rogers Center in Toronto where the Blue Jays play. And so we basically rigged all of the motors and chains and lights and everything from the actual curved roof of the stadium and, and then built the floor for, for the show itself. Um, the other ones that I do that are <clears throat> a little bit different than music is WrestleMania. Uh, WrestleMania is, is another one that um, is big. It's a one-off. So it's treated a little bit differently than a tour. Their budget is, is, could be considered roughly the same as a tour, but it is for a six-hour show. So you take what a tour has to, to run you know, 17 stadium shows, and WrestleMania can do it in one night. So we come in a month prior to start building the stage, the set, everything on the field, installing all of the pyro, all the video. And because it is a broadcast, they use quite a lot of power at 6,500 amps. And, and that comes with three broadcast trucks, 100 production trucks, because you're not just looking at, at the video and the lighting and the audio, but you're looking at TV crews and cameras and, and all of the other things that go into a pay-per-view production show. Um, this one is a fun one to do. There's, there's a good crew that, that manages this and, and uh, it's definitely different than doing the live music. There's no one star here. So you don't have that that corral of making the artist really happy. It's making the production as, as clean and, and amazing as you can. And then from WrestleMania, we go to Super Bowl, which is how I met Jay. Um, Super Bowl Miami was a very fun one. Um, this was the last event that I did prior to COVID-19 hitting. 
So this is the last time I remember not wearing a mask and being around a huge amount of people and successfully putting on um, a show with a with a large budget and and not a lot of worries. Um, <clears throat> for the Super Bowl, I do something a little bit different. I manage a lot of the video and creative assets for the events that surround the stadium. So the NFL Super Bowl experience. Um, the entries, game day fan plaza, basically anything that that is NFL hosted around the stadium, I have my hands in creatively and, and with video production. And then we get to this year's Super Bowl, which was quite a bit different. Um, masks on all times, double masking when you're inside. Um, Tampa, you know, thankfully was a nice place to have a show, but um, was a little bit different than than your standard production. Um, I know you heard from Brian on the overall feel of of what it was with um, wearing the mask. Smaller crew, you know, we felt that as well. You know, our my my role there is pretty um, niche when it comes to working with creative and video, but I was playing around with a lot more. Um, a lot more insights and 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 helping wherever I could because we were shorthanded, not just because people didn't want to come because of COVID, because they couldn't come because of COVID, and because we didn't have the budget to bring them because of COVID. So a lot of things went into to the changes that were this year, but we successfully had a a vaccinated healthcare worker concert with Miley Cyrus. And, and that concert was so special because even though it was a little strange to be around that many people, myself, um, you know, back in February and January was not fully vaccinated. So we had to stay back and still really socially distance, but watch a big group of people have fun and not feel worried anymore. Um, gave a little glimmer of hope for this industry. You know, we are still very far away from having huge tours. Um, there will be one-offs and, and fun events happening this summer outdoor, but but in terms of huge tours that are coming around, you know, that, that will take a while just because every state, every city, every place you go will have different restrictions. And monetarily that's that's a huge impact on on the tours bottom line in order to comply differently in each city um, but we'll get there and and it will be it'll be even bigger and better than it was before so um, I I really do need to apologize for my presentation not working um, this is what it looks like to have an event <laughs> uh, fully masked uh, uh, during during Super Bowl. Um, and I think that's what it'll look like moving forward for at least the rest of this year, if not the beginning of next year. Um, there, there's going to be a lot of precautions put into place for everyone's safety, not just the crew, but but also the fans that come to enjoy whatever spectacle that we can produce. I would love to to answer any questions and and see anything that you guys uh, want to ask. Yeah. Wow, Bree. Thank you so much. That I'm sitting here with my mouth open looking at how many trucks some of those things are taking you know 80 trucks my goodness that's just huge that's huge yeah but, and great to see that picture at the end was that pete soule behind the blue glasses <laughs> yeah <laughs> pete and rossi and pete, chad all, all yeah the game. yeah and j dot i think i saw in there yeah too. um hey we got a couple of questions going in the chat um timeline for organizing how soon before the event do you actually start working on it um, that's a good question. So it is obviously all dependent. You know, Super Bowl, for example, um, is usually two years out that they'll start managing and and working on the plans. I normally don't get involved with Super Bowl until about a year out before each of the cities. Um, <clears throat> with a tour, it's usually the routing is done uh, and probably pretty much solidified about a year out. So take and keep that in mind is probably a year and a half that they that they build the tour between holding all the dates in stadiums, getting the dates set, routing everything. And then from there, I usually get involved um, as soon as the routing is pretty completed. And, and then we really start to investigate in the staging and what production is going to be and how big that's going to be. And they, you know, there's a lot of set designers that work on all of those aspects, but I get brought in once, once the stage design is, 
to a conceptual conceptual size that that I can start building out what we may need for for the stadiums and and then that way we can help with budgets and and hotels and all of those good things. Gotcha. And then the same for WrestleMania then. Now on those one-offs, how how far in advance do you plan on WrestleMania? Well, WrestleMania is um, this anomaly in the production world because because WrestleMania is is the Super Bowl of wrestling doesn't mean that it gets planned in advance other than getting the stadium on hold and working with the venue themselves probably about six months out but the design and the set sometimes can can be changed you know uh, one of the ones that i did we we had a brand new set four weeks out because the the big boss man changed his mind and didn't like the set so we redesigned the entire set and had a new set come in four weeks prior wow. so we we were still receiving parts new parts and new pieces, you know, when we had already been on site loading. Um, but but there's a lot more money to be thrown at something where you know you're getting pay-per-view money coming in. Yeah. It sounds stressful. <laughs> that, that last minute it, can, it can be, but you, you know, when when it comes to when it comes to these events, you know, you you know what you're getting yourself into. And if you plan ahead, um, usually the stress only comes when problems show up. Right. So the proper pre-production means that sometimes the other things don't happen. Exactly. When it, when it does get stressful, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with stress? You, got you know, stressors? one of one of the, the most stressful things I would say is with my job is, you know, you can plan and prepare and, you know, coordinate and, and have all the logistics in a row. And you can be, you know, have have your notebooks and have your iPad ready and have any answer to any question. But but if you're in Ohio in the middle of summer, you don't know what weather could come up. So, you know, that is one of the more stressful things because lightning can be very dangerous. Um, and, and that kind of stress is the stress that really gets to me. Um, you know, the way that I cope with it, it <laughs> you know, staying on my feet, making magic happen, knowing that the fans are safe and having fun, um, that and then maybe a glass of wine at the end of work <laughs> or during <laughs> hiding in a corner. <laughs> but, but, you know, <laughs> in the end, in the end, it, uh, it's, it's really just trying to, to manage the stress into small doses with small problems that come up because the rest of it, you know, is all taken care of. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, the weather thing is interesting and we had to deal with that in Miami when we were starting to see some lightning and that's, you know, take it very seriously. Um, how much actual travel do you get to do? Is it being constantly on the road or are you only called into certain situations? You're, you're, you tour, so you're on the road. Yeah. That's right. So, so being the first one in the last one out, you know, I, I go, just say we're we have a show on Saturday. Normally, I will show up at the city on a Monday. Um, I will travel in on Monday, land, go straight to the venue, check everything out, make sure that everything I ordered is there and ready to go for the morning. Usually, have my my local or tour assistant come in and we label everything, make sure it's all good to go, set up the office, and then we start on Tuesday. So <clears throat> that would make three days of loading in. Production comes in on Friday. The show is Saturday production loads out Saturday night, then I load out Sunday, and then Monday I'm traveling to the next city. So with the stadium show, it's boom, 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 week after week. So with Taylor, I was gone for 10 and a half months um, oh. from home, and, and the other months were taking up with Super Bowl and WrestleMania. So I was really home total, probably six weeks all year in 2018. Um, so yes, it is a lot of travel. Um, it is something that that took me a it was a huge adjustment when COVID hit, you know, going from my tempo of really being home to oh, maybe three days a week to to being home all the time. Um, normally I am on an airplane probably three or four times a week, just depending on on what the schedule looks like. Sure, man. Yeah, COVID really got got us all there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just kind of put a slam on things. Um, let's see here relationships i've talked to you about these before and the importance of relationships and which relationship how do you get a, a client like taylor swift is the question well that's a good question i mean you know i i have uh, like i said i started in this industry when i was 16. um i was a runner and and from there you know really that first show was madonna groundworks tour it was dave matthews emmy lou harris and and from there, I kind of just fell in love with backstage, with concerts, with 
doing events, you know, being a part of this th and the feeling that it gave me. Um, and really from there, I, I worked very hard. I mean, sorry if this is censored, but I worked my ass off and, and being a female in the industry, that's what you have to do. You can't be afraid to speak up. You, you have to be able to, um, know and have confidence and kind of have this, you know, subconscious confidence in, in what you're doing. And, and I mean, I don't like the term fake it till you make it, you know, but my first show as a promoter rep, um, they were asking, you know, where the snake that I rented was. And I was like, S what, sorry, what do you need? Why do you need a snake? Um, you know, I was 20 years old and, and hadn't really been dropped into this position. And, and, the audio guy pulled me aside. It was like, I'll take care of it, but we're going to go through all of this afterwards. So it, it is about building these relationships and networking. Um, one of the first tours I did with was Kenny Chesney in 2007. And it happens that the promoter that promotes Kenny Chesney also promotes Taylor. So I was a product a site coordinator's assistant, a production assistant, and kind of uh, made friends with the promoters and showed them that I knew what I was doing, that I wasn't afraid of what I was doing. And and when Taylor came around, you know, they they needed somebody. Everyone else was booked, so they hired me. Um, the first show I did with Taylor, they actually hired a man to to oversee and make sure what I was doing was okay. And and you know, again, when I was site coordinating Taylor Swift, I was 24 years old. Um, I knew what I was doing at that point better than not knowing what a snake was. But um, it 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 kind of hurt a little bit that there was a man there, but I took him out for drinks afterwards and, and basically told him what was going to happen, told him to sit in the corner. And if anyone asked him any questions <sighs> to come talk to Bree and he was totally okay with it. He's still That's a good brilliant. friend to this day. And, and, you know, you just have to let the people know that are close to you and that are around you, that you got this and, and your actions will speak louder than, than your words. Yeah. That was, a, I'm glad you touched on that. Cause that was one of my questions about, being uh, a woman in this, you know, male dominated business and the challenges that you had, and you certainly answered that, you know, <laughs> um, and, and I get to watch that too. I get to watch that when we're at the Super Bowl. you know, you really do, <laughs> you, you run a crew like nobody I've ever met with or worked, had the, had the pleasure to work with before. And I'm not just saying that because you're, you're here right now, but oh, thank I, you. I really, I really do look forward to working with you every year. Um, Talk about work-life balance. You just talked about the tour and, you know, going 10 months out of the year. Are you able to find things to do outside of work um, and save time for, for your relationships? Yeah. So so I am married um, and I do have a dog, um, but I, I met my husband on the road. Um, he he was touring with the Stones when I was touring with Taylor. Um, so he, he does understand the business and, and he understands... Um, uh, can you still hear me? Sorry, my no. AirPod had died. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Um, so he he understands that aspect of it. He's no longer um, working in events, but but you know it helped a lot to have somebody that that gets it, someone that knows you know what to expect, and also to be flexible because he would just come visit. You know, he would come to the show in New Orleans or come to the show in Chicago, come to the shows where his cities that he's never been. Um, so there's that, but then the other side of it is that the road, you know, on, on tour, those people you spend every day with 12 hours a day for months on end, and they are family. So, you know, going out to dinner with them, you may still be people that you be with people that you work with, but it's not like your coworker at a nine to five job. These people know your ups, know your downs, know your good days, know your bad days. And, and they got you back so you know it, it's like it's like turning off the work and having dinner with this person you can literally turn off what you're doing at, at work not talk about it and have fun so you know that's that's kind of the work-life balance now do my at-home friends suffer a little bit of, of course but you know I, I chose to be in this industry and and you know you can make friends all the places that you go to to kind of make that balance happen yeah yeah it's tough. Work-life balance is, is something that we, you know, it's not always symmetrical balance. It's not always 50-50. Sometimes you travel for four months at a time and the pendulum swings this way and then it swings back and, you know, you, you can kind of see, well, I've got some time off after this tour and I can take a break for six weeks and for sure. you can kind of, you know, 
that's a way of balancing, I guess, you know, yeah, a, a, yeah. asymmetrical and, balance. Right. And, and, and a nice part of that too is, you know, I, I own my own business. So I, I know that at the end of Super Bowl, I'm usually home, you know, February 10th or February 12th, that, that I don't have to do anything until March 18th with WrestleMania. So I usually plan either staying at home and not doing anything or we'll go, my husband and I will take a vacation and we'll go away for a month. So we have that ability to, to find your balance and know that it's definitely the work hard, play hard mentality. Um, if you work very hard, you know, you can take that month off, but knowing that you're work very hard for four months and then you can have a month off works as well. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, that's no, no kidding. This is hard work, you know, for, for anybody, sure. that, anybody that, you know, has aspirations to get into the business. Um, it's, it's, it's a tough life, you know, yeah, being on it's the road. not glamorous there there. You may say that you work with an artist like Taylor Swift, but you're not the artist. So it may be glamorous for them, but it's not for us. <laughs> yeah. It, and it's, it's really hard work and long hours and, um, you know, but you love it. You gotta love it. You, you gotta to love, love it. it. You gotta if love it. If you don't it. like it, if if you if you have a, a little bit of doubt, you're not gonna be happy in it. Yeah, sure. good advice. What what other kind of you know anybody that's think because I know there's probably a lot of students out there thinking, I'd like to get into this business. You know what what uh, besides the runner? I know we talked about that. Let's elaborate yes. on that a little bit. You know how, you do, know, how do they with, go? With the runners, you know, um, they. It is a fun thing to get into. We we call you know we have some super runners. So basically, in each city, we have someone that has has basically made a career of this. Whether they're the runner or we call them the the runner wrangler, you know, and they're hiring all of the local people for the shows. Um, that's one way to do it. But you know the the part of this industry, um, I, I think more so than a lot of industries that that I've worked in is that it is literally about who you know. So. If you find yourself meeting someone in the industry, like myself, like Jay, that knows people, those introductions, those references, you know, if you go to my website, you're gonna see it's gonna, you're, it's laughable, and 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 I sure I can have someone make a beautiful website, but that's not how people hire me for jobs. They hire me because they know me. They hire me because someone referred me. They hire me because. They, that's what I do. And there's a very small niche in, in, in what I work with, but it's the same with audio engineers. It's the same with set designers. It is all about who you know and what relationships you can build. So LinkedIn, don't be afraid, be persistent. The The very first thing I did when I graduated from college is I, I had this connection. Um, his name is John Meglin and he, he is the president of Concerts West which is one of the, the promoters that basically is like a sister company of AEG Live. And Concerts West does Celine Dion, they do Roger Waters, they do Rolling Stones. So big names, but they're, they're boutique-y. So they really get to know these artists. Um, anyway, I had these aspirations of working with them and, and got the contact from one of my college professors and, and chatted with him, had an informative interview, and, and he said, I'll follow up. Well, he didn't. So I was very, very persistent. And what did that get me? They got me a, a, you know, promoter role for local Portland and Seattle shows. So it is all about following up, being persistent, and and you know, on top of that, that hard work. So yeah. building your craft. Don't be afraid to yeah, reach out, it. and all they can say is no, right? Yeah. All they can say is no. Um, it's interesting. You say it's all about who you know. And I'll, I'll add something to that. It's all about who knows you too, right? It's it's yeah. both ways because um, you want to be the person that when somebody says, hey, I need a psych coordinator, oh, Brie, right? Right at the first, you're the first exactly. name that somebody comes to somebody, uh, comes to mind is 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 that you want to be that person, you know? And that is a result of your experiences um, and your relationships and doing good work. You got to do good work or else you're not going to get hired again, you know? And Definitely. that means- you know, doing it, you know, in my world, you know, you're kind to one another, you know, you respect one another um, and you do the work for the right reasons. And that's success, too. You know, that's that's another yeah. another form of success. Um, let's see. What else do we got here? OK. How can people apply for jobs? Local jobs in productions, like maybe production students that are willing. Would you suggest they just contact their local venue, Brie, or 
or a yeah, live I nation mean, office? In, in a, a lot of times it just depends. You know, um, a, a lot of the promoter companies, Live Nation, AEG, they're based in, in California. Um, so yes, it is as simple as contacting them, contacting venues, and it just depends on what you want to do. You know, if you want to get into audio, if you want to get into video, reaching out to vendors that do that stuff because they can also hire a tech and teach you on the road. Um, and and then there's the flip side of getting into the stagehand side of the business, and and you can see if you actually like it. You know, you may be the grunt, but there definitely is a part of this business is that it's not just who you know, but it's about the hard work because again. Like we've said many times, the the concert touring industry is is not an easy gig. Um, it has its rewards. It is it is fun and 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 it can be very stressful. But it it definitely takes um, some a lot of knowledge and ingenuity and being on your feet. So um, in terms of applying, yeah, just start sending your re resume. You know, LinkedIn or or calling a venue and asking to work backstage, asking to be a runner, you know, asking to get in that way. Um, just not being, not being proud, too proud to, to start small. Yeah. Yeah. And getting, making those phone calls, it gets you, you know, if, even if you, they tell you no, they might remember you the next time and say, can I keep, will you keep my number around, you know, possibly. Um, Live Nation, the largest, uh, concert promoter, um, usually has an office in, in many cities. So I would suggest, that you um, go ahead and uh, do a Google search for Live Nation, go to their website, and there's a, actually a tab that says Live Nation Jobs. Yeah, um, and so AEG Live does the same, and and you know they're looking at bringing people back on now, and and have a lot of a lot of tours coming up um, in the fall, and and definitely next year. So yeah, I'm looking forward stay, to it. And I'm look, looking forward to seeing you in LA uh, for Sounds next year. Thank you so much, Three, Jay. Thank you.